Andy Ciara wrote the screenplay for Palm Springs. I'm at Noble Gold Derby. Here to ask you, Andy, in this Groundhog Day time loop-esque comedy, where did the sort of the, the idea start? Where, what was the first sort of idea you had for writing this film? Um, uh, well, it, it initially was never a like uh, time loop wedding rom-com. Uh, it, it started back in June of 2015 uh, Max, the director, and I, uh, we had just finished up at, a, at AFI, uh, American Film Institute, together, and we were like, let's make our first movie together. Uh, I'll write it, you direct it, let's come up with the idea together. Uh, something that's like we can shoot for super cheap, maybe find some like rich dentist to pay for, uh, you know, aiming for that micro budget level, uh, you know, f- following a proven model, um, you know, by Duplass Brothers and Lynn Shelton. And, uh, and like a, the, the one I love was a movie that came out just right around like just before that and we like saw that and like oh this you can do so much with a with a just a cool idea but just not a giant budget so we were looking at that and we're like let's 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 do something um, so we went out to Palm Springs and uh, talked about like you know what we what what this thing could potentially be and out of that weekend we pretty much we set on like let's set it in Palm Springs around like you know one location um and with the seed of a, of a character which is like we take a character who like claims to care about nothing uh to uh live in some type of perpetual like zen-like state um although it might be false but like we take a character who cares about nothing and put them on a journey toward to, to caring about something to uh, so like a journey from like i don't want to say purpose and meaning or, or purpose in caring but like for the sake of this sentence, uh, take a character from uh, who cares about nothing to a end point where he finds purpose in caring, um, finding meaning in a meaningless world. And so like that was, that's all we had that initial weekend. And then over the next two and a half years, the, uh, we would just, Max and I would get into a room and just like, you know, talk about life, talk about, you know, our own, um, you know, existential angst that we were, we were feeling. Uh, I was, I got married around the time at a wedding in Palm Springs. We were going, spent a lot of time in Palm Springs going to other friends' weddings. So there's like, there's some of that in there. And some of just like our own feelings of, of love and commitment and shame and depression and all of that. Um, and just, we, we would, we would have these like, I don't know. It's like we were playing in a, in a therapeutic sandbox together. And then I would take that and go right. And uh, it was a very inefficient way of, of, writing a screenplay because it was there was no outline for this thing at all and I would just go and like I don't know it was, it was more exploratory uh, and I would follow this character and the character kind of took shape character of Niles and then the other characters like kind of were just born out of writing in a way like and in, in, in this exploratory way of writing um, or approaching the story like I stumbled upon a cave or there was uh, the stumbled upon dinosaurs in a desert um, and <laughs> Yeah, this is this is a very not 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 a very poetic way of, uh, of of summing up where the idea came from because it's kind of just like it made sense as the as we were discussing uh, and as as I was like trying these like kind of failed drafts, I was like, okay, what's the uh, what's what's the best way to torture this character who cares about nothing? Well, you you, sit, you trap him for all eternity at a place where people care about everything. Uh, perhaps too much, the things that don't really matter as much, like, uh, you know, like a, a color, uh, color palettes for the, for the groomsmen and the bridesmaids or, or centerpieces or, or the hors d'oeuvres um, and these things that can actually cause like major rifts in families and friendships and relationships. But these things that like you, we put too much emphasis on those. So like now trap a person who cares about nothing for all eternity at a place like that. And that's where like, okay, now, now it's starting to make sense. Like, maybe we set it at a wedding and then we introduce a time loop thing there. But, you know, uh, as, as we know, Groundhog Day, Edge of Tomorrow, uh, Russian Doll, a lot, lot there's, it's been, it's, it's been ground that has been explored by smarter people than, uh, than me and all of us. So like, uh, we, uh, if, if once, once we landed on the time loop thing, we're like, okay, so in all these movies, uh, the character like kind of figures out the meaning of life or 
what they believe the meaning of life is or some version of that, they crack the code of life and they are gifted a way out of the loop. Um, and so let's say that our character figures out the meaning of life or what he believes the meaning of life is. And no, it's the, the, the code is not cracked. Um, the, the day does not end uh, or the, yeah, the, the next day does not begin. It's just gonna start over again the next morning. And uh, so I, we were curious, like, what can the one of the next like hundred or, or thousand or however many years um, look like once you've like hit that plateau point, um, which was always that character from 2015 when we left that Palm Springs trip, like that character Niles was always there. And then the time loop almost came out of the way to like justify his, uh, the, the, the way he looks at the world and like this kind of plateau that he lives on. And then how do you disrupt that? And you disrupt it with like, you know, bringing other people into the, in the time loop. And then in that process, like in, in, in writing Sarah, like that just became, she kind of became like the real center of the story. Um, but again, as I know, I'm just rambling on because it, there, this, there is no lovely way to sum up the idea for this one. It was kind of just like, it was found in the, in the writing and in these conversations, uh, these, these therapeutic sandbox conversations with Max. How, like, what was something like great or creative that came out of having a tight budget that maybe otherwise wouldn't have been done that way in the film? Um, I mean, I think like, I mean, it, it just, it just helped give me a target, I guess, throughout that whole writing process where like, and it, it, it helped actually like give some like defined boundaries or defined rules for this world. Um, like, so therefore having like, it's simply just keeping it in the desert, keeping it, you know, around one location um, for the most part. And like, just within that, then it, it just forces you to explore. And I get that, you know, that's also part of why that it's a time loop thing because it forces you to explore what would you do with just being stuck here. And then you have to like create limitations um, within that. Like, okay, well, if, if I was stuck, if, if every single day was the same, um, I would want to go travel somewhere else uh, just at least see. So then like I, I toyed with many, many versions of like, can they not get out of this thing? Or is, is it like, is it like Groundhog Day in that sense? Or um, then I was like, no, they can, they, can go, they can go anywhere just when they fall asleep. And, but Niles has already done all that. And so like, there's no, there's no hmm. point really to do it. Um, and it's, it's that, that's not what the movie is about. But it, I think because of that, because of the budgetary constraints, it forced some rules to be put in there. Um, then again, like, you know, like as I, throughout the writing of it, I, I missed that mark of the micro budget, like pretty immediately. Cause I still am attracted to some bigger set pieces or, uh, you know, a wedding in, in and of itself is an, an expensive thing to pull off, um, yeah, yeah. or, or dinosaurs or like that, the whole montage. But I think within that montage, I, I there are many things that I think a, uh, a, a, a different producing team, a different team of creative people behind the camera um, would have like, and different financiers would have said like, no, you can't do that. But that's the coolest thing about like, I think our entire team and um, especially, you know, the Lonely Island guys, it's that, uh, no, we can, we can pull this stuff off for a, for a small budget. Let's figure out how to do it. So for example, the, the, the plane crashing, that would be something that like, if you, if you read those two lines on a, on a page, if you have a, someone like, um, I don't know, a, a, a Michael Bay reads that, you're gonna spend a week doing a plane crash. Um, and it could be really cool. But then uh, we, we, don't, we don't have a week to give to a plane crash. We have about like two hours at the end of one day to get to give to a plane crash. So um, how do you do that? And so like, I think you, first of all, writing, like writing into the script, like there's, it's three shots. You have one shot of them sneaking up the airplane, one shot of them in the cockpit and the cockpit, cockpit, and then one, wide shot of the desert as the plane goes down and there's a, a VFX plane exploding. And I think that like, um, I, I, I personally have always been a, I, I find a charm in that, in, in the movies that I, you know, have grown up watching, like where there's like, it, the VFX aren't perfect, where you, you can see, you can, there, there's, a, there's a, a tactile quality to, to the film. Uh, and I think that's, that's just another like, kind of just plus side of like having the small budget. But at the same time, I would love to have had a, you know, a budget three times the size. Yeah. You were saying like when you were coming up with the concept of this film, we, you, you had just gotten married or you were getting married? Yeah. Like when, 
again, it, it was over the span of, a, of the three years before we, it was two and a half years of writing it. And then we got to the Lonely Island and then we was like another few months of developing it with them. And then we took it out for financing. So like, I would say like when we took it out for financing, that was the, that was the, the script that most closely resembles the final product. And there was, a, there was a three year period there. And within that three years, like I went from being just engaged to my, uh, my girlfriend at the time. And that's when Max and I went out to Palm Springs for that first trip. And then over that, over that span, I got, I got married um, and I had uh, my first daughter. So like yeah. all of that was, and that, that's the whole movie was found during that time. And that's all like, it's all tied to the movie. And th there was never a point where like, I stopped allowing all of that to influence the writing of it and, uh, yeah. and what we're ultimately saying, like, and you know, yeah. crossing that threshold into the cave at the end that it's that t taking that leap they take it together but it's, it's the same kind of leap that uh you know you take when you buy a house or mm. you have a kid or mm. you you start a new job whatever it is it's the same kind of thing it's just a taking a leap is terrifying so yeah I, like uh, what what's more expensive an actual wedding or a film wedding <laughs> uh i think i think a film wedding just because like <laughs> At least the the actual wedding, like you know, people, your the the guests show up because they want they want the food. <laughs> the food. For yeah. for a, a film wedding, you have to pay a lot of these guests. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no, no one's showing up for free, so th that alone I think makes it cost a lot more. But I think you know, on the other side of it, the the de the decor, uh, I'm I'm sure that actually the probably the film version is cheaper than like you know this the the wedding industry and how much they charge. Yeah, the wedding vendors. Uh... Like it's often an event that's a wedding the bills are higher than if it was a birthday party yeah. that you were getting. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Uh, I I have a lot of a lot to say about that. <laughs> maybe maybe the next film. Maybe that's yeah. the next film. Yeah. We I'm 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 not really, I'm not the biggest rush to write another wedding. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. What what was the toughest What was the toughest bit to get right, or the toughest scene or moment to just get right in the writing process? Um, the campfire scene that was yeah. one that like it didn't change that much from like the like an uh, I, I don't want because again I don't know what an original draft is on this one because there's been it's change of shape but like it that, that's one of the oldest scenes in the movie but it also like it didn't change that much like what the scene was supposed to do because it's like it's such this kind of a, a pivotal moment in the in the movie where like on the, the you have these two characters who like start to see the world through the eyes of the other and maybe realize the way they've been seeing the world is perhaps wrong. And then you also have these, it's, so it's doing that. It's, it's also these two characters who don't believe that they can love or are capable or capable of loving or, um, or can be loved by anyone else. And that's, that's another, another point where like the other person starts to see them. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a moment of like trying to get some true connection in there while also in the script, there's like just a, <laughs> trying to intellectualize this idea of like living in the present versus um, being too obsessed with the past or too focused on the future. And, you know, Niles is perpetually in the present and Sarah's like too focused on the other sides of it. So like, I was, I remember I was trying to try, I was trying to do too much in that scene. Um, and then finally when it like, you know, I, I made it through and I felt like, okay, there, there's a connection there. That's where it made sense. Like, well, this needs that I, this needs to elevate somehow now. And so that's, so therefore you see dinosaurs on the, on the horizon. Um, but it took a long time to crack. And even through like, and the reason I bring that one up is because I just remember even in like rehearsals, we were looking at that and really trying to go like line by line, like, what is it actually, what are, what are we saying here? What does it mean? And then uh, this, is, this would be a question for, for Matt, actually, when you talk to him later, yes. is that uh, I think you know, that that scene got cut down, rightfully so, because you didn't need as much as I had put in there. Um, and there's another scene later on that there's like a when when Sarah is describing the whole like how the mechanics of the loop. That was another like five page like explanation, like scientific explanation about like how it works um, with the whole diagram that she draws. And those two scenes were cut down significantly, but it's a and I'm glad they work. It was a good reminder. Like, what matters most is just is are we tracking the emotion of the scene? 
um, the getting, getting too bogged down and like intellectual stuff is like, no one gives a shit. Um, and, and I think Matt, Matt did a great job at like finding the core of both of those scenes. But, um, but the, yeah, I think the, the campfire one to me is like, it's one of the most important scenes, but it would, it just took a long time to actually find. Whereas the other like two most important scenes in the movie, which are, I think like, uh, Roy's Irvine speech and then um, the the big speech at the cave at the end when they walk in together those like are those weren't really cut down that much um, they those stuck pretty close to the script but uh, yeah. yeah campfire scene <laughs> what um, I'm also speaking I think with uh, Max tomorrow do you have a question for him that would be good to ask um nah He's, I mean, he, he, he and I, talked. <laughs> I mean, since the beginning of this, uh, I mean, we, we made a couple of shorts together um, at AFI and then since the beginning of this, when we went out to Palm Springs, like he and I talk every single day. Uh, so there's, uh, <laughs> th this, this movie was, was born out of, uh, you know, I mean, it's like a culmination of a creative friendship with him. Um, so like, I'm sure that, uh, I'm, I don't know how, I, I, I'm sure that I would I would already know the answer to everything that, he, <laughs> that I'd be I'd be asking him. So uh, this made my child try to find out something from him that you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Having worked with him so much and being so close with Max, uh, and this being your first sort of feature film together, what is a moment that you look back on fondly with him in the whole process of making it? Can be pre production or yeah. post production. Like um, there's two moments. There was one uh we were, I think I was just like, just punching up the script right before, right before we were gonna send it around to like, a, to our group of people, our friends. We didn't know what to do with it. I did not have a, I don't think I had a manager yet at the time. And then my manager, when I got him, this is toward the end of 2017, top 2018, that's when everything started changing. That's when it got like, we got to Lonely Island, but like it was just prior to that, it was really just me and Max and no one gave a shit about us. Um, like no one was asking to see a movie that we were gonna make. Um, and, but we kept on working at this and like, you know, on our own time because we just, we loved working together but also just like, we just needed it. It was again, it was like a, a creative outlet, uh, a, a therapeutic outlet. And so the first little moment I would say that our thing that I remember is that when we were at my uh, little bungalow, um, a part or one bedroom bungalow thing in uh, in Silver Lake and we were punching up the script and I like we I just put the script on the big on the uh TV screen and we were uh we were blasting uh Alex Cameron um are you a, are you an Alex Cameron fan uh the I, it, it, uh, like I like him but not my like my fate I'm not like a huge yeah, fan yeah, yeah. Uh, um anyway th I, there was this th there's something about like uh, I think it was it was what his uh, not the most recent album, the previous one that had just come out. And like, I was just listening to that album all the time. And I just remember like playing that album as, as Max and I are like, a, we have like a, a 24 pack of, of beer and we're just like going page by page, like just trying to like punch up the script together. Uh, like just spent, you know, a full day doing that uh, while, bla while listening to Alice Cameron and just like, you know, there's, there's that moment, which I think Max will also uh, remember. Um, and then the other thing was uh, at Sundance, when we were, we were premiering and uh, he and I were sitting in these, like, these back two corner seats of our, you know, the big premiere, um, the last time I was in a movie theater. Uh, yeah. And uh, we, I, I just remember like when the lights went down, like I, I, we both like grabbed each other, uh, like <laughs> just grabbed each other's hands. We're like, this is it. Cause I, like, I knew where my, my family was sitting, where my, uh, my wife and my brother were sitting and where his family was sitting, we're like a whole cast and crew, everyone is around us, but like lights went down, the Sundance trailer went up. Like I got, we both got a little emotional because like, this could be the end of our careers. <laughs> uh, in in, in eight, 86 minutes, people are gonna have an opinion about this movie and that might, they might say like, oh, these guys are fucking terrible. Um, and it was, it was just a weird, like the, the, the final moment where the movie is no longer like, there's many steps along the way where the movie just like the, the team behind the movie just expands and expands and we lived with it for so long just us two but then when we 
started working with party over here and like so then all of a sudden our our team gets bigger and it's just like it was a big family affair and like but that moment was like now it's out in the world now it's 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 we can't claim any kind of you know ownership over it because it just now it exists and now people react um and that was a kind of just a it was a terrifying joyful moment um that i'm glad i got to share it with him and then two seconds later is when the movie starts and the Lonely Island Classics title card comes up at the beginning and the entire theater was laughing at that before the actual movie started. They're <laughs> laughing at, at one of at just like the, the title card for Lonely Island. And that made, that was a big sense of like relief. I think we both felt there like, oh, this is, this is the right audience. For this, so. That's good. Well, it's out in the world now and um, in uh, awards contention for Golden Globes, Oscars, all the other awards that are coming down the pipeline. Andy, thanks so much for talking with us today. Uh, all the best of luck with those upcoming awards and for the film in general. And um, for people watching this interview, you can go to goldderby.com. Mm -hmm.